Well hello there, dear listeners. Welcome back on a journey around the world in 80 days. In the previous episode our indefatigable adventurers were just chugging along, when their train was attacked by the Sioux. A short gunfight ensued, during which the Sioux managed to capture three of the passengers. Among those three was our good friend and Mr. Phileas Fogg's loyal manservant, Passepartout. Mr. Fogg felt he had no other option than to arrange a search party to find and bring back the missing passengers. Eventually the passengers were found, but the time spent searching them, meant that Mr. Fogg had missed his train, and was now behind schedule. So then, let's get on with the story. Chapter 31. In which Fix, the detective, considerably furthers the interests of Phileas Fogg. Phileas Fogg found himself twenty hours behind time. Passepartout, the involuntary cause of this delay, was desperate. He had ruined his master. At this moment the detective approached Mr. Fogg, and, looking him intently in the face, said. Seriously, sir, are you in great haste? Quite seriously. I have a purpose in asking. Resumed Fix. Is it absolutely necessary that you should be in New York on the 11th, before 9 o'clock in the evening, the time that the steamer leaves for Liverpool? It is absolutely necessary. And, if your journey had not been interrupted by these Indians, you would have reached New York on the morning of the 11th? Yes, with 11 hours to spare before the steamer left. Good. You are therefore 20 hours behind. 12 from 20 leaves 8. You must regain 8 hours. Do you wish to try to do so? On foot? Asked Mr. Fogg. No, on a sledge. Replied Fix. On a sledge with sails. A man has proposed such a method to me. It was the man who had spoken to Fix during the night, and whose offer he had refused. Phileas Fogg did not reply at once, but Fix, having pointed out the man, who was walking up and down in front of the station, Mr. Fogg went up to him. An instant after, Mr. Fogg and the American, whose name was Mudge, entered a hut built just below the fort. There Mr. Fogg examined a curious vehicle, a kind of frame on two long beams, a little raised in front like the runners of a sledge, and upon which there was room for five or six persons. The high mast was fixed on the frame, held firmly by metallic lashings, to which was attached a large brigantine sail. This mast held an iron stay upon which to hoist a jib sail. Behind, a sort of rudder served to guide the vehicle. It was, in short, a sledge rigged like a sloop. During the winter, when the trains are blocked up by the snow, these sledges make extremely rapid journeys across the frozen plains from one station to another. Provided with more sails than a cutter, and with the wind behind them, they slip over the surface of the prairies with a speed equal if not superior to that of the express trains. Mr. Fogg readily made a bargain with the owner of this landcraft. The wind was favorable, being fresh, and blowing from the west. The snow had hardened, and Mudge was very confident of being able to transport Mr. Fogg in a few hours to Omaha. Thence the trains eastward run frequently to Chicago and New York. It was not impossible that the lost time might yet be recovered, and such an opportunity was not to be rejected. Not wishing to expose Auda to the discomforts of traveling in the open air, Mr. Fogg proposed to leave her with Passepartout at Fort Kearney the servant taking upon himself to escort her to Europe by a better route and under more favorable conditions. But Audar refused to separate from Mr. Fogg, and Passepartout was delighted with her decision, for nothing could induce him to leave his master while Fix was with him. It would be difficult to guess the detective's thoughts. Was this conviction shaken by Phileas Fogg's return, or did he still regard him as an exceedingly shrewd rascal, who, his journey round the world completed, would think himself absolutely safe in England? Perhaps Fix's opinion of Phileas Fogg was somewhat modified, but he was nevertheless resolved to do his duty, and to hasten the return of the whole party to England as much as possible. At eight o'clock the sledge was ready to start. The passengers took their places on it, and wrapped themselves up closely in their traveling cloaks. The two great sails were hoisted, and under the pressure of the wind the sledge slid over the hardened snow with a velocity of forty miles an hour. The distance between Fort Kearney and Omaha, as the birds fly, is at most 200 miles. If the wind held good, the distance might be traversed in five hours, if no accident happened the sledge might reach Omaha by one o'clock. What a journey, 
The travelers, huddled close together, could not speak for the cold, intensified by the rapidity at which they were going. The sledge sped on as lightly as a boat over the waves. When the breeze came skimming the earth the sledge seemed to be lifted off the ground by its sails. Mudge, who was at the rudder, kept in a straight line, and by a turn of his hand checked the lurches which the vehicle had a tendency to make. All the sails were up, and the jib was so arranged as not to screen the brigantine. A top mast was hoisted, and another jib, held out to the wind, added its force to the other sails. Although the speed could not be exactly estimated, the sledge could not be going at less than 40 miles an hour. If nothing breaks, said Mudge, we shall get there. Mr. Fogg had made it for Mudge's interest to reach Omaha within the time agreed on, by the offer of a handsome reward. The prairie, across which the sledge was moving in a straight line, was as flat as a sea. It seemed like a vast frozen lake. The railroad which ran through this section ascended from the southwest to the northwest by Great Island, Columbus, an important Nebraska town, Schuyler, and Fremont, to Omaha. It followed throughout the right bank of the Platte River. The sledge, shortening this route, took a cord of the arc described by the railway. Mudge was not afraid of being stopped by the Platte River, because it was frozen. The road, then, was quite clear of obstacles, and Philea's fog had but two things to fear, an accident to the sledge, and a change or calm in the wind. But the breeze, far from lessening its force, blew as if to bend the mast, which, however, the metallic lashings held firmly. These lashings, like the cords of a stringed instrument, resounded as if vibrated by a violin bow. The sledge slid along in the midst of a plaintively intense melody. Those chords give the fifth and the octave, said Mr. Fogg. These were the only words he uttered during the journey. Auda, cozily packed in furs and cloaks, was sheltered as much as possible from the attacks of the freezing wind. As for Passepartout, his face was as red as the sun's disc when it sets in the mist, and he laboriously inhaled the biting air. With his natural buoyancy of spirits, he began to hope again. They would reach New York on the evening, if not on the morning, of the 11th, and there was still some chances that it would be before the steamer sailed for Liverpool. Passepartout even felt a strong desire to grasp his ally, Fix, by the hand. He remembered that it was the detective who procured the sledge, the only means of reaching Omaha in time, but, checked by some presentiment, he kept his usual reserve. One thing, however, Passepartout would never forget, and that was the sacrifice which Mr. Fogg had made, without hesitation, to rescue him from the Sioux. Mr. Fogg had risked his fortune and his life. No, his servant would never forget that. While each of the party was absorbed in reflections so different, the sledge flew past over the vast carpet of snow. The creeks it passed over were not perceived. Fields and streams disappeared under the uniform whiteness. The plain was absolutely deserted. Between the Union Pacific Road and the branch which unites Kearney with St. Joseph it formed a great uninhabited island. Neither village, station, nor fort appeared. From time to time they sped by some phantom-like tree, whose white skeleton twisted and rattled in the wind. Sometimes flocks of wild birds rose, or bands of gaunt, famished, ferocious prairie wolves ran howling after the sledge. Passepartout, revolver in hand, held himself ready to fire on those which came too near. Had an accident then happened to the sledge, the travelers, attacked by these beasts, would have been in the most terrible danger, but it held on its even course, soon gained on the wolves, and ere long left the howling band at a safe distance behind. About noon Mudge perceived by certain landmarks that he was crossing the Platte River. He said nothing, but he felt certain that he was now within twenty miles of Omaha. In less than an hour he left the rudder and furled his sails, whilst the sledge, carried forward by the great impetus the wind had given it, went on half a mile further with its sails unspread. It stopped at last, and Mudge, pointing to a mass of roofs white with snow, said. We have got there. Arrived. Arrived at the station which is in daily communication, by numerous trains, with the Atlantic seaboard. Passepartout and Fix jumped off, stretched their stiffened limbs, and aided Mr. Fogg and the young woman to descend from the sledge. Philea's Fogg generously rewarded Mudge, whose hand Passepartout warmly grasped, and the party directed their steps to the Omaha railway station. The Pacific Railroad proper finds its terminus at this important Nebraska town. Omaha is connected with Chicago by the Chicago and Rock Island Railroad, 
which runs directly east, and passes 50 stations. A train was ready to start when Mr. Fogg and his party reached the station, and they only had time to get into the cars. They had seen nothing of Omaha, but Passepartout confessed to himself that this was not to be regretted, as they were not traveling to see the sights. The train passed rapidly across the state of Iowa, by Council Bluffs, Des Moines, and Iowa City. During the night it crossed the Mississippi at Davenport, and by Rock Island entered Illinois. The next day, which was the 10th, at 4 o'clock in the evening, it reached Chicago, already risen from its ruins, and more proudly seated than ever on the borders of its beautiful Lake Michigan. 900 miles separated Chicago from New York, but trains are not wanting at Chicago. Mr. Fogg passed at once from one to the other, and the locomotive of the Pittsburgh, Fort Wayne, and Chicago Railway left at full speed, as if it fully comprehended that that gentleman had no time to lose. It traversed Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey like a flash, rushing through towns with antique names, some of which had streets and car tracks, but as yet no houses. At last the Hudson came into view, and, at a quarter past eleven in the evening of the eleventh, the train stopped in the station on the right bank of the river, before the very pier of the Cunard Line. The China, for Liverpool, had started three quarters of an hour before. Chapter 32 In which Philia's Fogg engages in a direct struggle with bad fortune. The China, in leaving, seemed to have carried off Philia's Fogg's last hope. None of the other steamers were able to serve his projects. The Pereira, of the French Transatlantic Company, whose admirable steamers are equal to any in speed and comfort, did not leave until the 14th. The Hamburg boats did not go directly to Liverpool or London, but to Havre, and the additional trip from Havre to Southampton would render Philia's Fogg's last efforts of no avail. The Inman steamer did not depart till the next day, and could not cross the Atlantic in time to save the wager. Mr. Fogg learned all this in consulting his Bradshaw, which gave him the daily movements of the transatlantic steamers. Passepartout was crushed, it overwhelmed him to lose the boat by three quarters of an hour. It was his fault, for, instead of helping his master, he had not ceased putting obstacles in his path. And when he recalled all the incidents of the tour, when he counted up the sums expended in pure loss and on his own account, when he thought that the immense stake, added to the heavy charges of this useless journey, would completely ruin Mr. Fogg, he overwhelmed himself with bitter self-accusations. Mr. Fogg, however, did not reproach him, and, on leaving the Canard Pier, only said, We will consult about what is best tomorrow. Come. The party crossed the Hudson in the Jersey City ferryboat, and drove in a carriage to the St. Nicholas Hotel, on Broadway. Rooms were engaged, and the night passed, briefly to Philia's Fogg, who slept profoundly, but very long to Auda and the others, whose agitation did not permit them to rest. The next day was the 12th of December. From 7 in the morning of the 12th to a quarter before 9 in the evening of the 21st there were 9 days, 13 hours, and 45 minutes. If Philia's Fogg had left in the China, one of the fastest steamers on the Atlantic, he would have reached Liverpool, and then London, within the period agreed upon. Mr. Fogg left the hotel alone after giving Passepartout instructions to await his return, and inform Auda to be ready at an instant's notice. He proceeded to the banks of the Hudson, and looked about among the vessels moored or anchored in the river, for any that were about to depart. Several had departure signals, and were preparing to put to sea at morning tide, for in this immense and admirable port there is not one day in a hundred that vessels do not set out for every quarter of the globe. But they were mostly sailing vessels, of which, of course, Philia's fog could make no use. He seemed about to give up all hope, when he espied, anchored at the battery, a cable's length off at most, a trading vessel, with a screw, well shaped, whose funnel, puffing a cloud of smoke, indicated that she was getting ready for departure. Philia's fog hailed a boat, got into it, and soon found himself on board the Henrietta, iron hulled, wood built above. He ascended to the deck, and asked for the captain, who forthwith presented himself. He was a man of fifty. A sort of sea wolf, with big eyes, a complexion of oxidized copper, red hair and thick neck, and a growling voice. The captain? asked Mr. Fogg. I am the captain. I am Phyllis Fogg, of London. And I am Andrew Speedy, of Cardiff. You are going to put to sea? In an hour. You are bound for? Bordeaux. And your cargo? 
No freight. Going in ballast. Have you any passengers? No passengers. Never have passengers. Too much in the way. Is your vessel a swift one? Between 11 and 12 knots. The Henrietta, well known. Will you carry me and three other persons to Liverpool? To Liverpool? Why not to China? I said Liverpool. No. No? No. I am setting out for Bordeaux, and shall go to Bordeaux. Money is no object. None. The captain spoke in a tone which did not admit of a reply. But the owners of the Henrietta. Resumed Philia's fog. The owners are myself. Replied the captain. The vessel belongs to me. I will freight it for you. No. I will buy it of you. No. Philia's fog did not betray the least disappointment, but the situation was a grave one. It was not at New York as at Hong Kong, nor with the captain of the Henrietta as with the captain of the Tankadier. Up to this time money had smoothed away every obstacle. Now money failed. Still, some means must be found to cross the Atlantic on a boat, unless by balloon, which would have been venturesome, besides not being capable of being put in practice. It seemed that Philia's fog had an idea, for he said to the captain. Well, will you carry me to Bordeaux? No, not if you paid me two hundred dollars. I offer you two thousand. A piece? A piece. And there are four of you? Four. Captain Speedy began to scratch his head. There were eight thousand dollars to gain, without changing his route, for which it was well worth conquering the repugnance he had for all kinds of passengers. Besides, passengers at two thousand dollars are no longer passengers, but valuable merchandise. I start at nine o'clock, said Captain Speedy, simply. Are you and your party ready? We will be on board at nine o'clock, replied, no less simply, Mr. Fogg. It was half past eight. To disembark from the Henrietta, jump into a hack, hurry to the Saint Nicholas, and return without a passepartout, and even the inseparable fix was the work of a brief time, and was performed by Mr. Fogg with the coolness which never abandoned him. They were on board when the Henrietta made ready to weigh anchor. When Passepartout heard what this last voyage was going to cost, he uttered a prolonged ew, which extended throughout his vocal gamut. As for Fix, he said to himself that the Bank of England would certainly not come out of this affair well indemnified. When they reached England, even if Mr. Fogg did not throw some handfuls of bank bills into the sea, more than £7,000 would have been spent. End of chapter 32 And here we are, after some unconventional means of transportation and some hard negotiations, Mr. Philia's Fogg is back on the planned route. Can the Henrietta match the speed of a commercial steamliner and then some more to catch up with the lost time? Especially if they are heading for Bordeaux instead of Liverpool. Or can Mr. Fogg once again change the captain's mind during the trip? If you'd like to hear how the story continues, tune in next time. <laughs>